From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and welcome to this breaking analysis. I'm here with Eric Bradley, who's the managing director of ETR and runs their VEN program. Eric, good to see you. Very nice to see you too, Dave. Hope you're doing so well. Yeah, we're doing, doing okay, hanging in there. You know, you guys in New York are fighting the battle. Looks like we're making some progress here. So, you know, all the best to you and your family and the wider community. Um, I'm really excited to have you on today because I had the pleasure of sitting in on a CIO CISO panel uh, last week. And um, we're going to explain sort of what that's all about. But one of the things that ETR does that I, that I really like is they go deeper with anecdotal information. And it's almost like in-depth interviews in these round tables. So they complement their quarterly surveys and their other drill down surveys with other anecdotal information from people in their, in their community. So it's a tried and true survey practice that adds some color to the data set. Um, so guys, if you bring up the agenda, I want to share with the audience what we're going to talk about today. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, we just did intros. I want to ask Eric uh, what ETR Van is, and then we'll go through some of the guests. But, but if we go back to, to Eric, it, explain a little bit about Van and the whole process and how you guys do that. Yeah, sure. I, we should hire you for marketing. You just did a great job actually describing that. But uh, about three years ago, what we decided was, ETR does an amazing job collecting the data. It can tell you what's happening, who it's happening to, and when it's happening, but it can't always tell you why it's happening. So uh, leveraging a lot of my background in 20 plus years in journalism and uh, institutional Wall Street research, we decided to take the ETR community, the people that actually take the surveys, and start doing interviews with them and start doing events uh, with them. And enabled to doing that, we're basically just trying to complement the survey findings and the data. So what we always say is that ETR will give you the quantitative answer and Venn will give you the qualitative answer. Now guys, let's bring up the agenda slide again. Let's take a look at the folks that uh, participated in the, in, the, in the round table. Now for ETR's clients, they actually know the names and the, the titles and the, well, the company that these guys work for. We've anonymized it for the public, but you had a CIO of a global auto supplier, a CISO of a diversified holdings firm who actually had some hospitality exposure, but also some government contract manufacturing exposure, uh, chief architect of a software ISV and a VP and CISO of a global hospitality resort chain. So you had three out of the four, Eric, were really in industries that are getting hit hard. Obviously, the, yeah. you know, the, the software you know, company yeah. maybe a little bit better, but maybe you could add some color to that. Well, actually, the software company, unfortunately, was getting hit hard as well because uh, they're a software ISV that actually plays into the manufacturing space as well. So um, this particular panel of uh, CIOs and CISOs were actually in a very hard hit industry. We are going to make sure we do two more follow ups with different industry verticals to make sure we're getting a little bit of a wider berth and uh, collect all of that information in a better way. But coming back to this particular call. Uh, the whole reason we did this, and as you know, you spoke to my colleague and friend, Sagar Kadakia, who is the director of research for ETR. And we were nimble enough to actually change our survey while it was in the field to start collecting data on what the real-time impact was on the COVID-19 pandemic. We were able to take that information, extrapolate it, and then say, okay, Let's start reaching out to these people and dig deeper, find out why it's happening. And even more so, is it permanent? And which vendors are going to win and which vendors might lose from it? So that was the whole reason we set up the series of calls. We've only conducted one so far. We have another one this coming Tuesday as well with four entirely new panelists that are going to be from different industry verticals. Because as you astutely pointed out, these verticals were very hard hit and not all of them are as hard as others. So it's important to get a wider cross-section. So guys, let's take a look at some of the budget impacts, the anecdotal sort of evidence that we gathered here. So, so the, let me just scan through it and then Eric, I'll ask you to comment. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, which, like, like Eric said, some hard hit I I industries, all major projects, anything sort of next gen have been essentially sh shelved. That was the, the ISV. And then another one, we cut at least 70% of the big projects moving forward. 
Um, he mentioned ServiceNow actually called him out, but ServiceNow is a SaaS company, you know, probably, you know, weather the storm here. Uh, but he did say we've, we've put that on hold. The, the best comment, you know, as a service has saved our SaaS. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, that was great. And then we're going to get into some of the networking uh, commentary, some really interesting things about how to support the work from home, you know, kind of shifting from a hardened top into uses you know, re uh, remote workers. And then a lot of commentary on, on security. So, you know, that's sort of a high level scan. And there's just so much information here, Eric, but, but maybe you could sort of summarize on some of those, that commentary. Yeah, I, we should definitely dig into each of those sectors a little bit more, but to summarize what we're seeing here was um, the real winners and losers are clear. Uh, not everyone was prepared to have a work from home strategy. Not everyone was prepared to send their workers out. Their VPN wasn't, didn't have enough bandwidth. So there was a real quick uptick in spending, but longer term, we're starting to see that these changes will be become more permanent. Uh, so the real winners and losers right now, we're going to see on the loser side, traditional networking. The MPLS networking is in a lot of trouble, according to all the data and the commentary that we're seeing. It's expensive. It's difficult to ramp up bandwidth as quickly as you need, and it doesn't support remote. So we're seeing that lose out, and the winners there are in the SD-WAN space. Uh, it, it's going to be impossible to ignore that going forward. And some of our CIO and even CISO panelists said that change will be permanent. Also, we're seeing at the same time what they were calling a on, on SaaS and cloud. Now, we know these trends obviously were already happening, but they're, be, they're being exacerbated. They're happening even more quickly and more strong. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. That, of course, is at the expense of network, I'm sorry, uh, data centers, whether it be your own or hosted, which has huge ramifications on prem, on -prem hardware even the firewall providers. So what we're seeing here is, obviously we know things are gonna be impacted by this situation. We didn't necessarily expect all of our community members and IT decision makers to talk about them being possibly permanent. So that on a, on a high level was something that was extremely interesting. And the last one that I would bring up is that as we make this shift towards working from home, towards remote access, you also have to align yourself with the security that can support that. And one of the things that we're seeing in our data side on ETR is a widening bifurcation between the next-gen security vendors and the more traditional security or the legacy security players. That bifurcation just keeps getting wider and wider, and this situation could be the last straw. So I want to uh, follow up on a couple of those things. You, you talked about uh, uh, sort of the network shift and, and you know, toward SD-WAN. What people have described to me is that they've got a, you know, a hardened top, it's a hierarchical network. Uh, it's, it's, it's very well understood um, and it's, it's safe, right? And now all of a sudden you got all these remote workers. And so you, you've, you've got to completely sort of rethink your whole network architecture. The other thing I want to uh, drill into is um, your cloud commentary. There's a comment that I saw, Eric, that really stood out. Um, one, of the, one of the folks said, I would like to see the data centers be completely deleted, if you will, or closed down. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to see, you know, a lot more of this, obviously, not only from the standpoint of, and you heard this a lot, the kind of pay by the drink, uh, but just generally getting rid of all that sort of so-called non-differentiated heavy lifting, as we often hear about. That is a um, extreme comment. I don't think everyone feels that way. But yes, the comment was made and we've heard the comment from other people. As you and I both know, the larger the enterprise, the harder that is to go completely SaaS. Uh, but yeah, when, when a situation like this happens and see the inflexibility of their on-prem on infrastructure, yes, it becomes something that really has to be addressed and it, it can become a permanent change. I was also shocked about that comment. Uh, that, that gentleman also stated that his executives outside of the IT area, the CEO, the CFO, had never, ever, ever wanted to discuss cloud. They did not want to discuss work from home. They did not want to discuss remote access. 
he said that conversation has changed immediately. And to the credit of the actual IT companies out there, the technology companies, they're doing everything they can with this opportunity to make that happen. Yeah, and so uh, you're right. I mean, the whole work from home conversation, that's to your point earlier, Eric, big chunk, chunks of COVID, you, you know, the post COVID world are going to remain permanent. Guys, bring up the SaaS uh, 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 slide, if you will, the SaaS commentary as a service saved our SaaS, the wittiest quip award, according to ETR. You know, but you had, it was very interesting to hear folks. In fact, uh, I think somebody even called out, hey, you know, we expected Oracle to, you know, be auditing us, but they're actually being very supportive, as is IBM. Uh, uh, Salesforce was an interesting comment, Eric. One of the folks said they would share accounts, you know, on-prem, uh, but when they all do the work from home, they had to actually buy some more. You also got Cisco with, with big props. Um, uh, Microsoft was called out. A, a lot of organizations actually allowing them to defer payments. So the SaaS vendors actually got very high marks, didn't they? They really did. And it, even I wrote that uh, summary and it was difficult to write that about Oracle because we all know <laughs> that they're infamous for auditing their own customers in 2009, uh, 2009 right after we came out of the financial crisis. Uh, they have notoriously been a bad act. I don't know if they found religion and they decided to be nice to their customers, but every single person mentioned them as one of the vendors that was actually helping. Uh, that was very shocking. And we all know that when bad situations happen, people become opportunistic. And right now it's really seeming that the SaaS vendors understand that they need a long-term relationship with these customers and they're being altruistic instead, which is really nice to see. Yeah, I think, the, um, I think anybody with a cloud realizes that, hey, we have an opportunity here to the lifetime value of that customer. Whereas maybe in 2009, right. you know, Oracle didn't have a cloud, they had to get people in a headlock to try to preserve their you know, income statement. Um, if we, let's go to the networking uh, drill down guys, that next slide, uh, because Fortinet, we, we, you know, some of the things that we've been reporting on uh, is the sort of divergence in valuations between Fort, Fortinet and Palo Alto before this whole thing hit. Fortinet has done a really good job with its cloud offerings. Uh, Palo Alto struggled a little bit with trying to figure out the sales compensation is maybe a little bit behind, Although both companies got, got strong props and, and I've talked to a number of customers and Palo Alto is going to be in the mix, but Fortinet from a cloud standpoint seems to be doing quite well. Obviously networking, you know, Cisco is the big gorilla there. Um, but so, and we also got call outs from guys like Trend Micro, uh, which was interesting um, from, from some of the folks. So your thoughts on this, Eric? Yeah, I'll start on the networking side because this is something that I, I really, I've dug into quite amount in, in not only this panel, but in a lot of interviews. And it really seems as if as networking refresh starts to come up and it's coming up with a lot of large enterprises. When your network refresh comes up, people are going to do an RFP for SD-WAN. They are sick and tired of paying MPLS network vendors and they really want to look at something else. That was even prior to this situation. Now what we're hearing is this is a permanent change. I particularly had one person say, uh, I wanted to find this quote real quickly if I can, but basically they were basically saying that from a permanency perspective, the freedom from MPLS will reduce our network spend by over half while more than doubling or tripling our bandwidth. You can't ignore that. Uh, <laughs> you're going to save me money and triple my bandwidth. And hey, by the way, my refresh is due. Uh, it's something that's coming and it's going to happen. And yes, you mentioned a few, right? There, there's Vipteller, there's VeloCloud, there's some big players like Cisco, but Palo Alto just acquired Cloudgenix in the midst of all of this. They just went and got an SD-WAN player themselves and they just keep acquiring a portfolio to shift from their on-prem to next gen. It's going to take some time because 70% plus of their revenues is still on-prem hardware, but I do believe that their portfolio that they're creating is the way the world is moving. And that's just one comment on the, the traditional networking versus the next gen SD-WAN. And, and, and the customers have indicated, you know, it's not easy just to get off of their MPLS ne networks. No. I mean, it takes time. It's like slowly pulling off the Band-Aid. <laughs> but like many things, COVID-19 has sort of 
accelerating that. We haven't talked about digital transformation. That came up as a right. maybe more strategic initiative, but one that you know very clearly has legs. You know, David, it's very simple. You just said it. Uh, people, when things are going well and they're comfortable, they don't change. And that's the same for an enterprise or a company. Hey, everything's great. Our revenue's fine. Why would we do this? We'll worry about that next year. Then something like this happens and you realize, wow, we've been dragging our feet. That digital transformation that we've been talking about and we've been a little bit slow to accept, we need to accept that we need to move now. And yes, it was another one of the major themes. And it sounds silly for researchers like you and I, because we know this is a theme. We know cloud adoption is there. We know digital transformation is there. But there are still a lot of people that haven't moved as quickly as they should. And this is going to be that final catalyst to get them there without a doubt. Uh, quickly, on your point of Fortinet, I was actually very impressed uh, with the commentary that came from that. Because Fortinet is sometimes one of those names that you think of that maybe plays in a, in a smaller pool or isn't as big as some of the 800-pound the gorillas out there. But uh, in other interviews besides this, I heard the phrase coined of uh, 40 everything. So through R&D and through acquisitions, Fortinet has really expanded the portfolio. And right now is their time to shine because when you have smaller satellite you know, offices and branches that you need to connect, they're really, really good at it. And you don't always want to call a Palo Alto and pay that price when you have smaller branch offices. And I actually, I, I, I was glad you brought up Fortinet because it's not a, a name that we get to herald that often. And uh, it was deserving from this panel. Yeah, and, and you know, companies that can secure gateways, secure endpoints, are obviously going to have momentum. Zscaler came up. You know, I think that's, and, and, and I say, tell you, looking at, I've done a couple of breaking analysis on security and Fortinet has been strong in two dimensions. You know, ETR as, as our audience is, I think, getting to know. We really look at two key metrics. One is a net score, which is a measure of spending momentum. And the other is market share, which is a measure of pervasiveness. And companies like Fortinet in, in security, you know, show up on both of those dimensions. So um, it, it's notable. Yes, it certainly is, it is. And I'm glad you brought up Zscaler too. Uh, very recently by client request, uh, we did a very in-depth research on Zscaler versus Palo Alto Prisma Access. And they were very interested. This was before all this happened. Um, you know, does Palo Alto have a chance of of catching up, taking share from Zscaler? And I've had the pleasure my, myself personally hosting uh, Jay, uh, the CEO of Zscaler, at an event in New York City. And I have nothing but incredible respect for for the company. But what we found out through this research is Zscaler, at the moment, their technology is still ahead, according to their investors. There is no doubt. However, there doesn't seem to be any real secret sauce that will stop Palo Alto from catching up. So we do believe that parity of a feature set will uh, shrink over time. And then it will come down to Palo Alto obviously has a wider end user base. Now, what's happening today might change that. Because if I had to make a decision right now for my company on Secure Web Gateway, I'm still probably going to go to Zscaler. It's the name. If I had to choose that in a year from now, Palo Alto might have had a better chance. So in this panel, as you brought up, Zscaler was mentioned numerous times as uh, just the wave of the future, along with Casby brokers, right? Whether you're talking about a Netscope or a Force Point or um, all those people that also play in the Casby space to secure your access. Zero trust is no longer a marketing hype term. It is real and it is becoming more real by the week. And so I, I want to kind of end on one of the other comments that really struck me because we're constantly talking about, okay, do you go with a portfolio of, of a suite of services or do you go with best of breed? Um, what about startups? You know, are, are startups more risky in, in, in a crisis like this? And one of your panelists, I, I just loved his comment. He said, um, you know, one of the things that I've always done, he said, you always hear about the guy, oh, we're going to go to the garden. We're going to check out the magic quadrant we'll pick out three guys in the upper right-hand corner and, and test them out. He says, one of the things that I've always liked to do is I'll pick two from the upper right and I'll take one from the lower left, one of the emerging uh, techs, and I'll give them a shot. They won't win every time, but then he, then he called out FireEye 
as one of the organizations that he found early that gave them competitive advantage. Right. Love that yeah, comment. It's a, it's a great comment. And honestly, if you're in charge of procurement, you'd be stupid not to do that. Not only just to see what the technology is, but now I can play you off the big guys because I have negotiating leverage and I can say, oh, well, I could always just take their contract. So it, it's silly not to do it from a business perspective. But from a technology perspective, what we kept hearing from these people with the smaller vendors and my, my partner, Peter Stubbe, my colleague and I, who, uh, who did the host together, we asked this question really believing that the financial insecurity of the moment and the times would make smaller vendors not viable. We heard the exact opposite. What our panelists said was, no, I'd be happy to work with a smaller vendor right now because they're going to give me pricing flexibility. They're going to work with me right now. I don't need to pay them upfront because we're seeing a permanent shift from CapEx to OpEx and the smaller vendors are willing to work with me and I could pay them later. So we were actually surprised to hear that and, and, and glad to hear it because to connect to your other point, the other person who was talking about security in a platform approach versus best of breed, he said, listen, platform approaches, you're already with the vendor, you can bundle a little bit. But the problem is, if you're just going to acquire a new technology, every time there's a new threat, the bad guys are just going to switch the threat. And you can't acquire indefinitely. So therefore, best of breed with security will always beat platform. And that's kind of a message to Palo Alto and Cisco, in my opinion, because they seem to be the ones fighting that out. Even Microsoft now trying to say that they're a platform approach in security. Well, and it says to me, the security business is going to, as we predicted, is going to stay fragmented because you're still going to get that best yeah. free. You know, just like cloud is going to be fragmented and it's, you know, multiple vendors. We Ever since I've been in this business, people are trying to consolidate the number of vendors, but technology moves so quickly, it gives competitive advantage. Eric, awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to next Tuesday uh, with the next Venn and love to have you back and talk about it anytime. You're a great guest. Thanks so much. Certainly. I'll do my best to get a better AV connection last the next time, guys. I apologize for that, but it was great talking hey. to you. Tonight. Hey, we're all learning, you know, so <laughs> thank you everybody for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE and we'll see you next time.